Now, as we turn to the international markets, we want to start with U.S. exports and then look at how things are changing. So obviously, the numbers here, excuse me, are a bit skewed to the upside. Uh, That's obviously that this is the four week rolling average, which has us over four million barrels a day. Again, it's something closer to about 3.7, 3.8. You know, the average, when you look back, has been taken down to about 3.66, which is right in line with what we've been talking about for September. And, and it's something similar. Like, we, we're just, we're going to be very strong. It's going to be elevated. I'm by no means saying that it's, it's going to be at that 3.7, 3.8 million barrel a day. And a lot of that is going to be supported based on what is happening in, uh, in Europe, what is happening abroad. You know, you still have the uh, the strikes at the national uh, nations oil refining side. So that, again, that they're releasing uh, France and is what I'm speaking about now is going to release product from the national uh, strategic fuel reserve. You know, you do have uh, you do have some loadings in the uh, the North Sea. They're at 13 month highs. That will help alleviate some of that, especially because you have Libya that's right at about 1.1. You have CPC coming back a bit, which will help, but it's not going to diminish the need for U.S. crude. Now, as we said before in from segment one, as the real cut is about 500,000 to 750,000 barrels a day, you know, the question is going to be, where is demand? If demand continues to be weak, well, they're just kind of moving back into some sort of equilibrium. But that equilibrium is going to support elevated prices. And, and that's where when we look at just the underlying impacts, it's going to hit emerging markets the hardest. It's going to hit a lot of these countries that are struggling with inflation, that that stickiness in the core side. And then when you look at the U.S. backdrop, which has a horrendous uh, you know, distillate setup heading into winter, it's only going to make things a bit worse. You know, some of the things that we're going to talk about more on the FSC show is looking at the Russian flows. So it just so happens that uh, that when you look at Nord Stream One, it was fully destroyed. So there's two there, there's two setups. There's the because uh, remember the inside of the pipeline was never created to to weather. Um, uh, seawater, but there's multiple levels of protection around the pipeline to protect it from seawater from the outside. So Nord Stream 1 had a total breach, which means that there's seawater inside the pipeline. It just so happens that Nord Stream 2 only had a partial and was on the outside, not on the, there was no internal breach. So they've, Gazprom has now said, if you want gas, it has to be on Nord Stream 2, not Nord Stream 1, which is a little uh, interesting backdrop when you start looking at, you know, who did what, why did it happen? So it just so happened Nord Stream 1 was fully torched, but not Nord Stream 2. It's like, okay. And then uh, Europe, uh, the gas problem has increased some flows back into Italy. So we'll talk again more about that as we go into, uh, into, next week, uh, into Friday as some of that continues to develop. Now, Middle East floating storage still is over 2021 levels, and obviously outside of 2016, which was the remnants of the OPEC uh, price war, you can see that it's very high. So when you think about the reduction of 750, 500 to 750,000 barrels a day, a lot of that is going to be, or really all of it is going to be dictated in the Middle East. So are they doing this because they want to bring this back to normal? And it's really going to come down to OSPs. If they, if, if Saudi Arabia runs the OSPs higher, well, then clearly they don't care about this. And they, like, they, this is purely a matter of price, keeping things elevated. But if they cut, like as they did with the OPEC, and then they cut pricing, well, here is where they're looking to get some of this excess back into the market because they cut supply, but they're also cutting prices, which should help on the demand front. So the, that's going to be some of the balancing act. Now, you have China that has that even though they've issued their import quotas, it's well below average, which is, again, going to be are they seeing some of this concern on demand? And they're getting in front of it just to keep uh, storage where it is. But again, storage where it is will keep prices right around and fairly range bound, which is really been our base case at this point in terms of where we are. 
at more of a range bound capacity as we go forward and as we continue to to uh, trend into the end of the year. So now when you look at Dubai and the Brent swap, you can see it's trending a little bit higher. It's at six dollars and forty cents, but it's not at fifteen. It's not at thirteen. It's you know it's, it's something that is a bit more manageable which is why there's a likely chance that the OSPs, if they go up, it'll be small. But I think Saudi Arabia's, you know, the, the, S, the expectations is for a raise in prices. The question is going to be how much. Is it right in line with estimates, which normally happens? They normally raise prices heading into winter. Or is it something that is going to be a bit more egregious like they did before in terms of, you know, $9, 13 uh, you know, coming in almost $13 more once you factor in the spreads? Or is it going to be something a bit more muted or even a reduction? I think it's going to be that balance between where is floating storage, you know, what are they trying to accomplish? And I think the OSP side is going to be that rounding piece to what is that under that underlying strategy, especially as global crude oil on the water hits a new record. Uh, Obviously, it's the 2020 had higher levels, but for this time of year, this is a record and it is currently at a record for 2021. Uh, for 2022, going back to our comments about what is happening in the international world, what is happening on the floating market. And then when you look at in transit, yes, you had a decline of floating storage, but there was some of that that clearly went into transit because we're now at a new 2021, uh, 2022 high for crude oil and transit. And you did have some of it go into, into onshore storage. So there is still a lot of crude on the water and they're looking at this and saying, well, does it make sense to take some of that off and let some of this clear before we, before they start to, uh, to adjust pricing? And, and again, this is some of those different pieces. None of this is going to be good for inflation. None of this is going to be good for stagflation. This is just something, a matter of where is the supply demand balance at this point? And we still think, you know, obviously demand is low, but they're cutting supply to come very close to where we've seen some of that demand drop off. And then that floating storage you can see here is now just below where we were in 2021. And we still think it it tracks fairly close to 2021. But this is, again, we're, we're still at a very elevated level for floating storage. And the goal is to get this off the water and into not only onshore, but also trying to balance the market in terms of where this these shipments are. Just because of what is happening with Russia, it's unlikely we'll ever get you know, back to that normal level, especially given the uh, the miles per ton and some of these m- movements around the world. And as we said earlier in segment one, Asia was the biggest uh, reason for the drop off in floating storage. And a lot of this is being moved onshore. And that's where we're going to continue to see that because the, the, the push has been for China to increase run rates, which is going to pull some of that crude from floating storage. But there is more behind it which is still going to keep things well above average and, and, and very much above normal. You know, when you look at the teapots, they were fairly flat. But remember, our comment was the target was not for teapots to benefit. You know, they would a little bit just all, all t- you know, rising tides lift all boats. The focus was really on the state-owned facilities and getting them to benefit the most uh, and going from that 75% utilization rate closer to 85, 60, uh, 85, 86% utilization rate. West Africa, floating storage still remaining elevated. And again, they're remaining elevated even at something that is well below even the new target. So West Africa doesn't have to cut any production. Like they're already well within their threshold of of the new levels because a lot of this is going to be targeted to the Middle East, which is begs the question, you know, where what is the strategy in general, which is why we've talked so much about what is happening at the Middle Eastern side, not so much all of OPEC because Russia's already compliant, West Africa's already compliant. Parts of uh, Africa, uh, you know, all parts of Africa are, are already really compliant. So the question is going to be, how does the Middle East react to this? Now, when you look at China super tankers, you know things are fairly normal, uh, and and that again is going to keep things fairly stable. 
as they continue to take in this crude at a discounted rate, especially when you look at where things are for West Africa, where things are for Russia. You know, right now pricing, we don't have any yet. We should have some by the end of the week and we'll be able to talk about that a bit further. Exports from the US, uh, gasoline was down 189,000 barrels uh, a day, but again, still above the five-year average where distillate had a big spike of 369,000 barrels a day. And that is where we have seen some of these shifts. Uh, and, and you can see here on the five-year average, that is still 376,000 barrels above the five-year average. And that's where we still see some of those movements in general. Now, when we look at propane, propylene, it fell by 90,000 barrels, but again, still 356,000 above the five-year average. And this is, I think, a huge component of where we're seeing the market, where U.S. onshore demand for LPG propane has come down, but we're still seeing that in international exporting side. Uh, total crude oil exports, again, there's still some of that timing delay. Where it, it was last week at 4.6, now at 4.5. That's above the physical capacity. So it just means that there's some of that, that paperwork that's being cleared. That normally happens between uh, September and October. I, I'm sorry, between end of month, new month. So as that clears, I think you, you know we'll get back to, we'll have a makeup number to the downside, but still that 3.7, 3.8 million still is right in the right area. Now, when we look at gasoline exports, again, as we've been saying, it's going to remain above the five-year average, you know, just within the top of that cloud. And that's something that we think is going to continue. Now, distillate had that big spike. Again, the, the pricing abroad is, 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 is there, so might as well do it. And again, as you take away and fill some of that international demand with that, uh, the excess that is in pad three, that opens up pad one to purchase a bit more, bring some of that 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 uh, product into the market, especially as we see more flows from Asia and the Middle East into the Atlantic Basin. Now, ethane uh, here you can see that in general you we it come down it's come down it's still going to be above the five year average. You know, ethane is still flowing at an elevated clip. And now when you look at crude oil exports, again, you can see just how high we are. We do expect that to drop back down. This is looking at the week over week. We, you know, we, we like to focus more on what is the four-week rolling average telling us. And then propane, propylene, again, still uh, seasonally adjusted all-time high, still running well above normal. Now, when we look at, uh, at Fujara, Fujara had a, a build of 314,000 barrels coming in at 24.873 million. Uh, light distillate rose 402,000 barrels coming at 7.806. 7 East of Suez gasoline complex was a bit stronger just because there's a view that China's new, uh, new export quotas could bleed into next year as well. So the view is that they're not going to, the, the view is changed where they're not just going to dump it into this year, but actually also put it into Q1 of next year, which would be a little bit more bullish, uh, bullish pricing. And again, uh, and, and draw down or keep storage from going to the levels that were initially uh, perceived. Uh, the market is anticipating Chinese government to issue around 15 million tons, uh, which again is 116, 116 million barrels of exports, uh, comprising about 13.2 million of gasoline, gas oil, jet, and that's where there's th that's where things are are really showing, and that's what things people are looking at. Middle distillate uh, fell by 283,000 barrels. Uh, to 4.423. East of Suez gas oil complex was still fairly uh, strong. You know, LNG, uh, uh, Pakistan failed to get an LNG tender. They're still relying as, on as much uh, middle distillate as they can. And again, as, the, as that remains expensive, going to the fuel oil side, residual side. So middle distillates is still going to be in a very bullish backdrop. Uh, stock of heavy resid rose 195,000 barrels. Uh, again, to 12.644. Demand was, was fairly less than average, but again, that's what we expect as we see some of that slowdown in shipping, which is why as middle distillate remains here, heavy disty rises, that will bring down prices and they'll, people will run the heavy resid in order to manage uh, their power burn. Uh, Brent time spreads, uh, we've now rolled into the December, January contracts, and you can see here they're still elevated, which again is going to support pricing a bit. 
which is why we're we're talking more about where some of that is, where some of that sits. And again, we, we see a lot of that uh, staying power at these levels. Now, when we look at, uh, at just some of the flows here, you can see Norway uh, moving back up in November, which is as we were talking about, you know, 13 year highs, you know, there's a lot of uh, movement, which is good. Angola saw some bleed out from October into no, into November. Same with Nigeria. So again, some of that, some of those increases are, are still below normal, a little bit more elevated. We we'll get we'll get an update either tomorrow or Friday on how some of the sales are going. Libya has uh, set a uh, I think it's a three year record for the most exports. Uh, which isn't saying all that much, but it's again just showing that there is that push to get that product into the market. And there's obviously a beholden buyer when you're looking at Europe. And then a CPC comes back online uh, in 10 days. It should be up and running by October 15th for uh, port for um, the 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 port one and two out of the three. That will also increase some of the availability. But it, it's just going to be a matter of where the differentials are because West Africa, we want to see some of those sales really increasing. A uh, small build in Europe, uh, right around normal. Uh, again, we don't see too much adjustment in terms of where Europe is, just given the amount of, uh, of demand, or at least, I should say lack thereof from a refining standpoint. That is uh, now with uh, France uh, shutting down some of the refiners. That's, again, going to leave some more product in, uh, in storage and pull some refined product out of storage. So gasoline had a small drop of 21, still very elevated at 1.27. Uh, gas oil, small build of 125. Still, again, when you look at that chart, you can see even though it's a build and it's good, you're still well below normal, well off where you should be, and the pressure can still continues to remain. Now, when you look at gasoline, even though it's come down, you can still see second, uh, you know, we're, we're tracking 2020 levels and you can see the delta between the two is massive. Uh, and, and we don't see that adjusting anytime soon, just given the lack of demand internally and, and the it difficulty exporting it, just given the arbitrage, which is going to keep some of this stuck in, in Europe. And then oil, uh, fuel oil inventories uh, tracking seasonally, that seasonal drop. Uh, a lot of this is, again, going to head from west into east uh, Suez as those countries look to burn a bit more fuel oil. Singapore uh, drop of, of just under 2 million. Uh, still, again, very much in line with seasonal. We're right at 2021 levels. The biggest issue remains the disconnect between everything else and middle distillate. Light distillate had a small build, but when you look at middle distillate, it had a sizable drop. So when we look at light distillate, Seasonally adjusted all-time highs were above where we were in 2020. You know, I, obviously, for, for there was that big spike and then a drop-off. Again, the, the light distillate side isn't the issue. It's the middle distillate, which is going to keep those prices elevated. And then when you look at everywhere around the world, the seasonally adjusted, it's the biggest drop. It's the, we're the lowest we've been. And that is re a reverberating commentary throughout the whole system. But as gasoline builds remain elevated, is it going to be enough to, again, offset where some of these drops have come? And, and right now we're, seated, we're, we're starting to see some of those economic run cuts because of the gasoline side you know, and the distillate unable to carry the gasoline front, which is going to continue to push these and keep these uh, reduced as Resid uh, sits you know, just above uh, average. And we just have been expecting this to remain above average uh, through the remainder of this year. North Sea uh, should trend a bit higher, uh, but not by much, you know, just right along seasonal norms. And then when we look at Europe, that has dropped off. Some of that went from offshore to onshore, and we expect this to stay right around this level. Uh, so that's what we have for you today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find us in the comments section. Obviously, you can find us on Twitter or email. And thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network.